Amen. If you will, open your Bibles to the book of Acts once again, uh, to chapter 8. We'll begin uh, our reading in just a moment in verse 4. We'll be reading through verse 25. Again, uh, the book of Acts, uh, chapter 8, we'll begin here reading in verse 4. I think if you had told those original uh, 12 apostles that uh, upon being called to follow after the Lord Jesus, if He had said to them, guys, we're going to establish a new thing. Through what I'm about to do in my body, we're going to create the church. And the church is going to be a new thing, a new entity. And in that church, we're going to accept without any reservation Gentiles. And we're also going to go into Samaria and not only accept, but we're going to recruit Samaritans to be equal participants in this new thing that will be called the church. Now, believing that when Jesus called these disciples that God was already at work and that He was drawing them along, even if Jesus had told them that, while they might have been more than just a little mildly chagrined, uh, they would have stayed with Him. But they would have certainly had many doubts as to whether or not this grand theme with this grand purpose could ever be accomplished. But yet, there is a gospel because of Jesus Christ that does redeem, that does reconcile, that does span, that does bridge each and everything that does divide. And so, let's look, as we're in that transitional panel or section of the book of Acts as this young man by the name of Philip takes the gospel into what was surely a new and unknown world. He goes with the message of salvation, the accomplishment of Jesus Christ to this area that we know of as Samaria. Read with me. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. Uh, for unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that 
anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Pray with me. Father, once again, we thank you for your word. It is a word that is certain. It is a word that is sure. It is a word that is always relevant. It is always powerful. We have every confidence that your word has not and will never return void. We thank you that it will go forth and it will accomplish that for which you have sent it. Uh, Lord, I pray that in these moments that uh, eyes would be opened, that ears would hear, uh, Lord, that hearts would indeed receive uh, your truth. Uh, for the sake of their eternal soul and for your glory. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There are a number of things that come to us from this particular section of Scripture that uh, certainly would catch our attention, that we could uh, discuss at length uh, uh, as uh, believers, as, as those that have affirmed the truthfulness of uh, the Word of God, believe it relevant in, in every season. And one of them... Uh, would be, first of all, the, the reality, the, the mention of persecution, uh, of affliction, of days or seasons of difficult or frowning uh, providence. Uh, sometimes you will hear me speak that way, use that term, that this is a, an occasion, this is a season of an unsmiling or an unfavorable providence. Again, the acknowledgement. And I believe it is biblical that in all things God is sovereign. That in all things Jesus Christ rules and reigns. That He is Lord. And even in our affliction, He has a purpose and a plan to work all things for our good. And then we see also uh, the question of miracles. To what degree should we uh, expect or even uh, pursue uh, something in the realm of the uh, miraculous, the, the, the supernatural. And uh, associated, I think, with that is what I'll explain in a moment uh, as being something of a, a two-step or a two-phase or a two-tier uh, sequence of conversion that we see more than once in the book of Acts. And then we see... Uh, the question related to salvation, to sin, and what we would call apostasy. That is a falling away from the faith. And so we cannot e exhaust everything that could be uh, said about any one of those subjects, much less uh, exhaust everything to be said about all three. But, but let's look at them as we work our way uh, through this, this portion, uh, this portion in which... Uh, that which Jesus said, the gospel, uh, the church would take root in the city of Jerusalem. And then, without explaining uh, the how uh, or, or the when this would happen, he said that the gospel was going to go next into Samaria. And then after that, into all of the world. And so we see this next step of global evangelism, of the advance of the kingdom, of the power of the gospel to dynamically and powerfully change and to bring together that which indeed was divergent, was distinct, was uh, separate, even greatly at odds. So we see the church uh, described there in verse 4 as being uh, scattered uh, because of the persecution that had begun 
uh, in what we looked at last week, uh, kind of highlighted uh, by, by the, the martyrdom of Stephen, and we're introduced uh, to this young man uh, whose name is Saul, Saul of, of Tarsus, and he is described as ravaging uh, the church, a, a, a word that, that really uh, is associated with, with what a wild beast would do uh, to a, a corpse or to a, a body and just tearing it uh, limb from limb. And uh, we can remember again from our text last week that those that, that would murder Stephen, they, they gnashed, they ground their teeth as though a wild animal that could not uh, wait to, to draw blood. And so uh, there is great evil afoot and it is afflicting uh, uh, the church. But in the affliction and in the, the challenge and, and, and in the, the people being harmed by what would ultimately be a, a refining fire the gospel is not diminished the the evangelists are not quieted as they go forth and they go forward uh, we're told down to the city of Samaria the com commentators debate as to uh, what particular city is being discussed here suffice it to say that uh, the uh, that Philip uh, went north in terms of direction uh, he went uh, uh, down in in terms of of elevation uh, into this uh, region this nation that was known as Samaria uh, if you know a little bit of your uh, biblical uh, history uh, we we know uh, that uh, the Samaritans uh, were those that were hated uh, by the Jews and we'll look at that a little more closely uh, here in just a moment but they went and we see right there in verse 4 and verse 5 two, two words that are, are important to us. They went about, those that were scattered, those that were because of persecution, they, they were forced. Uh, seemingly it was a, a wise thing for them to leave uh, Jerusalem for their self-preservation. But they went about not forgetting the gospel, but taking the gospel with them, and they were preaching uh, that gospel. The, the Greek there is... Euangelizomai, again, related to euangelion. Uh, they went about speaking uh, the gospel, the, the message of uh, salvation. And then we're told that they went down to Samaria and they proclaimed it. They carusoed. We've talked about the kerygma and the act of caruso, of proclaiming the essential truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the gospel of the king and his kingdom has now arrived. Uh, the king has come to save his people, to redeem a people for himself. And so Philip uh, goes uh, to Samaria. And if again, if you're reasonably aware of the flow of biblical narrative, verse 5, just the first few words, should at least catch your attention. What? This bunch of good Jewish boys are willingly and intentionally going into this region inhabited by people that they hate. Uh, they're going to a place in which there's been uh, centuries of even warfare, uh, of, of, of all kinds of conflict between those that were known as Samaritans and those that were Jews. In fact, if you'll remember Jesus in assigning and commissioning some initial initial in, uh, endeavors, missionary endeavors uh, to the apostles. Uh, in Matthew 10, 5, we're told, Go nowhere near the Gentiles, enter no town of uh, the, the Samaritans, but rather uh, go to the lost sheep of Israel. And then uh, John notes as kind of an editorial comment uh, there uh, in the, uh, the account of the woman at the well in Samaria. Uh, he says, well, for Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. There, there was animus, uh, there was prejudice, there, there was racism uh, abounding uh, there in this relationship between uh, these Jews and the Samaritans. Now, uh, Samaria was, was a, a splinter off, it was a, a division, it was a schism uh, in ancient Israel that came about at the death of Solomon and uh, uh, we often talk about the, the ten tribes uh, go, uh, abandoning uh, the southern region uh, uh, where, in which uh, Jerusalem uh, was founded. 
And so those ten tribes went off, and very soon and very quickly, uh, they descended into apostasy, and they were destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 uh, B.C. And when they were destroyed, uh, the region was depopulated and repopulated. That is, uh, there were uh, those of the ten tribes that were deported, and there, there were those from foreign nations that were imported, and they uh, became a people of uh, mixed uh, culture and mixed uh, race, and they began to practice a very compromised, a very, we would call it a syncretistic form of religion. It had uh, some uh, kind of uh, reflection of ancient Judaism. They, they at least admired the, the Torah, but they also uh, brought in various uh, erroneous and evil and idolatrous practices. And uh, uh, the Jews hated them uh, for this and more. Eventually they would uh, erect uh, their own temple at Mount Gerizim uh, so that the nation would be uh, united and not be tempted to go to, to Jerusalem and work, uh, worship at the temple that God had recognized. And so there's this long history of uh, friction, of schism, and even warfare between the Jews and the Samaritans. And so Philip goes to this hated people group and he proclaims uh, the gospel. And, and we're told there, look there at verse 6, that the crowds with one accord paid attention to them. That, that they, they went and, and people were prepared to hear. God had prepared them. Now, I suspect some of the preparation was from the fact that Jesus had passed by there, or through there years earlier, had encountered this woman at the well, she had heard the gospel from him, had proclaimed and confessed that he was the Messiah, the promised one. And many others had come and heard this Jesus and had believed the gospel. And so uh, whether they were fully converted or whether they were just aware of uh, the, the life and the ministry, the, the record of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's hard to know. But whatever it was, when Philip arrived, when Philip arrived they were a people that seemed to be prepared uh, to hear the gospel, and we never would want to discount that. Uh, I'm, I'm not a Wesleyan, I'm not a big embracer of what's uh, in his theology is called provenient grace, but I do believe there's an element of what might be called common grace, or you might even think of it as special grace, that even before the gospel is preached, uh, there are people many times that, that are hungry, that are prepared, that are just receptive for the hearing of that gospel. I can speak of it in kind of the opposite or negative uh, way many years ago we were on a mission trip in Cleveland Tennessee Bible Belt town now see Jeff Dalton nodding his head he knows exactly what I'm gonna talk about but we did some uh, evangelism did a little crusade in a public park and I stood there preaching and I don't know there were dozens if not hundreds of people gathered around uh, obviously in my very small and still and quiet voice in that setting no, we even had amplification. And yet, I felt as though I were talking to a concrete wall. I mean, even physically, the sound just seemed to be bouncing back at me and just, and just shaking me. And I looked, and, and there was absolutely nobody paying attention. It, it was just, you know, I think in the Charlie Brown things, there's this wonk, wonk, wonk. And that's... That's all it felt like, that, 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 that God had not in any way prepared them to hear. And so we always pray in evangelism, God, please go before us. Please be there long before we even arrive. And it seems as though uh, He was there. The gospel had been there earlier, and certainly the, the Spirit uh, was uh, there. And so uh, the gospel, the kerygma, the essential elements of truth regarding the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, were being proclaimed uh, there. And it had a dynamic impact. They heard Philip and they observed, they experienced various signs through 
Philip. One, if you'll remember, that's one of this seven that was uh, set apart for a particular ministry to widows, but yet along with Stephen, and we don't know, possibly some of the other seven. Uh, they were gifted uh, to speak of Jesus Christ and his gospel, and even evidently God anointed them uniquely uh, to be an instrument through which uh, the supernatural would occur, miracles uh, would occur. And, and so uh, in the process of proclaiming uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, unclean spirits were cast out and uh, seemingly with the same type of uh, audible and maybe even uh, visible uh, signs that accompanied Jesus as he did uh, those types of things. Uh, uh, they, they were cast out. The, the people were set free from demonic uh, uh, possession. Uh, there were those that were actually even healed uh, from paralysis or being lame. That, that the gospel was powerfully at work and we've already spoken to the issue is it normative uh, for uh, this type of supernatural sign uh, to accompany uh, the gospel I would argue and at least in our context it's not normative but I would also say that God hasn't changed one iota and that the gospel is still powerful and I've said this before uh, I do not believe in miracle workers but I believe in a God who works miracles okay and so what he chooses to do, particularly in a unique setting, uh, kind of a first occasion of the gospel going into a people group, uh, who knows what might uh, happen uh, as the power of gospel comes to bear in that, uh, in that situation. And because of the gospel, and every time the gospel is received, every time the gospel is believed, every time a person is born again let me tell you this there's a supernatural act and the captives are set free okay that's been happening for 2,000 years and it will happen until the day Jesus Christ uh, returns and so uh, because the captives were set free because the captives are still being set free again uh, there is much joy at the preaching of the gospel as the gospel is being preached as these things that are happening as uh, God is obviously at work there is an encounter with a man that's identified here as Simon he is a uh, magician uh, he sometimes is referred to as Simon Magus uh, he is one that I would think of probably as being quite pompous quite self-serving uh, we'll see someone else similar uh, to him Elemas uh, that appear a few chapters down the road in Acts chapter uh, 13 but he was one that is described as previously having practiced magic, that, a magic that amazed uh, people, that, that drew people uh, to him. I'm quite sure he took advantage of uh, all of these factors and uh, enriched himself while doing all of this uh, magic. And his claim was that he was indeed uh, somebody great. Now, anytime we see something like this, whether... Uh, in history, whether in the contemporary world, where we see it in the Bible. Uh, Satan is allowed, it seems, at times uh, to so work in individuals that they do things that uh, at some level uh, suspend the normative uh, rules of nature. That is, that they can do uh, supernatural type things. Uh, also, typically, probably along at the same time, uh, those that... Uh, are the instruments of Satan uh, learned by way of cunning and deceit how to practice cunning and deceit. That they learn how to use all types of, of tricks uh, to, uh, to carry out uh, their, their vicious, uh, their vile, uh, their demonic uh, ministries. Uh, I've, I've said this and I'm not the keenest guy about some of the discussions about spiritual warfare. I do believe it's a reality. Do, do not take me that way. But typically, when there is an issue and it's a sin issue, and somebody, you know, oh, well, that's Satan, and, you know, we're going to bind him and we're going to cast him out and so forth and so on. Typically, my first response, listen, yes, Satan is alive and well. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But first and foremost, let's deal with this. You've got a sin problem, and that's on you. Quit trying to blame Satan for your own stupidity, for your, your own willful rebellion against God. And so, uh, whatever the case uh, may be 
Uh, yes, indeed, there, there is a real devil. He has real demons. They're active in the world. And if you encounter something that makes the claim of being of the occult or makes the claim of being able to where this read palms or read uh, horoscopes or read tea leaves or I don't know, whatever, whatever the deal is. Probably most of the time in this country it's going to be a hoax. But you never know. You never know if there really is an association with a real personal demon. And I would advise you, please, stay away from it. Uh, as One of the, the great things that's occurred here in the last uh, few years, and, and I, it was kind of interesting, I asked one of my fellow pastors this week if they were doing any type of fall festival and so forth and so on. And he said, yeah, we're doing a big trunk or treat. And I thought to myself, thank God we're not. And now y'all looked at me like, oh, Tim, why not? Years ago, uh, when I was at Philadelphia Baptist and Rejoice, Delima was with us. Many of you have met Rejoice, uh, our friend from uh, Tanzania. And as we had a big event, it was big enough, Fox, Fox TV station would be over filming us, and it was wild. And he walked across the street, Rejoice walked across the street, and I was about yay big around. What in the world are y'all doing? We fight demons and witches and vampires every day in Africa. Why are you inviting them onto the parking lot of this church? And that always stuck with me. I, I couldn't help but driving through one of our fair cities this week to see the witches tour parade or celebration or whatever it was. I can't remember what the sign says. They're nothing to be celebrated. They're nothing to be celebrated. And um, so I'm thankful that years ago uh, we got out of the, the business. And um, it there are realities there. I'm not telling you your kids can't have a Milky Way on Reformation Day, properly known, properly celebrated. But again, beware. Uh, that stuff is more real than you might ever think about. So, he had a, a following. Uh, there was both probably the real power of Satan. Uh, there was uh, counterfeit things uh, going on. Some commentators, and this is on very shaky evidence, they think that he may have been kind of one of the early leaders of what became known as Gnosticism. I don't know. Possible. Uh, certainly, he would have had uh, many uh, false uh, beliefs. But we're told there in uh, verse... 12. Again, Samaria is embracing the gospel. Uh, they are believing uh, the good news. There are many converted. Philip is preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, this Messiah that that woman on the well years earlier had said, we know that Messiah is to come. And so again, he came and he tied everything together. He wove the tapestry of the king and the kingdom that the king has come. The king's name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has entered our world as the Son of God and the Son of Man. And He has come and He has lived this perfect life and He has died an atoning death on the cross at Calvary for our salvation. He has paid the price for you to be accepted in this great kingdom. And He invites you to repent and to believe. And this great king, make no make mistake about it, he rules and reigns. Not only this kingdom that we would call his kingdom, the, the kingdom of the, the church, he rules over all things. And he rules all things well. But this kingdom, is, it is in the world, but it is not of the world. It has a unique origin and purpose and destiny. But to be sure, this kingdom transcends uh, our world and it informs our participation in this world and it is indeed through the power of the gospel triumphing over this world and so we're told that having heard this message not only were there men and women hearing believing being baptized look there at verse 13 even Simon himself believed and was baptized and we're told that he indeed was amazed by those miracles. 
I don't know if that's a little foreshadowing, a little warning that's planted there for us, but at any rate, he publicly aligns himself with Philip and his message and the central feature and theme and person of that message, uh, Jesus Christ. So upon that, verse 14, Peter and John go to Samaria. Uh, again, uh, this uh, uh, John is the same guy that is recorded as asking Jesus, Do you, would you like for us to pray for fire to rain, that rain down on these Samaritans? Wow, my, my, my. How attitudes, having been informed by the gospel and having been empowered by the Holy Spirit, how they do change. And so here uh, go uh, Peter and John kind of on an inspection and evaluation tour to instruct as a statement of unity, of, of uh, solidarity with uh, the, the church in Jerusalem. If there's one gospel, there's one church, there's one king, one kingdom. And so they go, really for what amounts to reciprocal validation and authentication. Uh, that is, they want to say upon their authority as apostles, indeed, you have heard and you have believed the, church, uh, the truth and you are received uh, into uh, uh, the church. Okay, And that, that they want to see that indeed they are the real thing. Uh, they are genuinely... Uh, converted. And so we're told that upon going there, this unique thing that is unique to the book of Acts, it occurs a number of times, we're told they came down, they prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, at Pentecost, uh, the gospel is preached and the promise is upon believing that you would receive uh, this great gift of the Holy Spirit. Why is it here in Samaria they are said to have believed? And let me just throw in my deep conviction about believing. If they believed, they were born again. They were regenerate. They would not believe were they not regenerate. The Spirit was at work, but not in the fullness that they would experience post Pentecost. But why? Since they weren't second-class citizens in the kingdom, why was there a sense of postponement or distinction uh, between uh, the fullness of the Spirit and the regenerating work of the Spirit? And something of this, what I, I referred to a moment ago as a second phase or a second tier or a two-step type salvation, a, a salvation in which you receive Jesus as your Savior, but you're gifted with the Holy Spirit or you're in, um, indwelled with the Holy Spirit at a later date. And that's been mangled by many groups over the years. I don't have time to survey all of the history to that, but it's interesting enough, uh, probably I'm more familiar with how the charismatics kind of mangle that. Uh, you know, you're a Christian, but you're not really a good one until we come and lay hands on you and you can, you know, flop on the floor like a fish and foam at the mouth and babble, okay? And uh, so um, you, you've got that aspect, but why are y'all giggling? There's no giggling. And then there's groups that stayed as the Catholics, that have something of the same scheme. And even it really persists with the Presbyterians and, and some of the Reformed groups. that You baptize your infants and then you confirm them. And again, I can't even get into all of that. It just makes my mind blow up. But here's the deal. I believe that it was a one-time reality experience for those in the church that they would see that indeed this group that was divergent, it was distinct, these, these Jews would have seen them as schismatic, they would have seen them as heretics, okay? And they were prejudiced against them, okay? But these Jews could see that God had uniquely worked, that He had unilaterally saved, 
and they were to be received and there was to be accepted and there was to be solidarity and there was to be unity and there was to be fellowship because they too believed and were beneficiaries of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, saying that, we believe, I believe, you should believe if you want to be right. You can giggle at that one. That when you are converted, when you believe, you believe because God has so worked in your heart to believe. He's raised you from the dead. He's regenerated you. And in that moment, at simultaneously, the Spirit comes and the Spirit indwells. And you are saved. And you are sealed by this Holy Spirit. Again, we see in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul writes, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 1.21, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has put His seal on us and given us His Spirit on our, in our hearts as a guarantee. Paul also speaks to it conversely in Romans 8, 9. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. And so the Spirit is the seal that comes upon us at the moment of our new birth. He indwells us to empower and to never leave us or forsake us. Okay, now look at verse 18. In the midst of all of this, the Spirit's at work. People are receiving the Spirit, being gifted in unique ways by the Spirit. Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, and he offered them money. One of the things I've told you before, uh, that until 1992, uh, when I'd been out of high school at least a couple of years, the only thing I could have told you about John Calvin and Martin Luther was what Coach Steve Peppers taught me in world history when I was 15 years old, okay? Which was very little. But another thing that he taught us in world history was this t concept of simony. It comes from this guy Simon's name. It's the attempt to buy church office with money. Historically, that's been known as simony. Okay? And so here you see the origin of that concept that Simon is so impressed and seemingly has such a carnal, worldly, sinful understanding of the gospel and its power that he thinks, I'd love to add this to my bag of tricks. I mean, I've got tricks. I've got power. I've got all kinds of ways to deceive people. I've got all kinds of ways to convince people that I am indeed of, of the great power. Indeed, I am uh, the great power. If, if I can just uh, give them a little money, I'll have a more complete bag of tricks. I'll have more things at my disposal to continue my demonic and my devious ministry. And Peter responds in verse 20. May your silver perish with me. I love that the Apostle Peter is always so gentle, uh, just kind of, you know, just wants to kind of calm things down and, you know, never wants to incite anybody. Wow. And why? Because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you're in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me, Lord. Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. This begs the question, what about Simon? Was he a genuine con convert? I was very disappointed uh, that I didn't get to see and, and actually play golf with uh, my, my Methodist pastor friend. I had some questions for him uh, this week, but he, he didn't come. Maybe he didn't want to answer my questions. But I would have been curious as to what their position, being Armenian, you can be saved, then you can lose it, okay? Uh, what their position would be, and, and certainly the, even the commentaries that I own are all over the board as to what was going on. Was he converted? And this was just a sinful episode in his life. And he was uh, genuine about desiring to find a place of repentance and recognized his, his error and he turned back to Christ. 
Uh, was he uh, a, a, a someone that was converted and then he lost it? Well, I think we can rule that one out. Okay, we, we can we can drop that one. My position, and I don't, I can't. You know, it's not a hundred percent certainty. I believe he was an individual that never fully believed, that was never ultimately converted. He was not born again. He was not enjoyed with the Spirit. He appeared to have believed. It's interesting that the Scriptures say what? He believed. And he was actually baptized. He was at least externally doing the same things everybody else was doing. He was associated with uh, the church. But indeed, I believe he was a counterfeit. You can believe differently if you would like to be wrong. But I believe that he was one who never truly came to know Christ. And, and the tragic lesson for us, folks, at so, in so many ways, in so many levels, there are many. Jesus even spoke about it. There were many on the last day say to me, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out demons? And his words will be, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. That this has always been a phenomenon. This has always been a reality. John identifies them even with the Antichrist. They were once a part of us, but they went out from us doing what? They proved that they really were not of us. Jesus spoke in Matthew 13 about those in the parable of the soils. There will be those that respond positively, but fail to persevere. They fail to endure uh, to uh, the end. We saw the warning from our reading uh, this morning from Jude chapters three, uh, verses 3 and 4 and 5 and following that there's those that will creep in unnoticed and at the end of the day they prove themselves to be unbelieving. That's why I say to you the message is always to every one of you if you ever leave here well, there was just no application to that sermon. I don't know how to go out and be the better version of me tomorrow. Here's the application. Examine yourself daily to see if you're of the faith. Repent and believe the gospel. Okay? Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. That's the application of every time I step into this pulpit. That's the application of every time I eat lunch with you. That's the application of every encounter I have with you. That's the, that is the application to me right now, standing right here. That's always the biblical application. And so, again, tragically, we see this time and time again. Let me turn to the book of Hebrews real quickly. There's so many examples from, from Hebrews, but... We're going to very rapidly come to a close. Hebrews chapter 4. Some of these I've used and alluded to any number of times. But in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1, again, the encouragement to perseverance. The danger of apostasy, of counterfeit, or being counterfeit. Therefore, while the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For those who have believed uh, entered that rest. And then uh, verse 7, again he points to a certain day. Today saying through David so long afterwards, in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your voice. Again, he's alluding to the wilderness generation. They saw it and they heard it all. And yet ultimately, they proved themselves to be unbelieving and they failed to attain that which they so earnestly sought. And I believe that's always a warning to the church. I think it's always something that we should soberly think about. Well, back in Acts, let's close. Yes, this tragic incident of Simon hearing, having opportunity, hearing the truth, and yet, even though he seems to have departed and probably continued to afflict the church, we find that the gospel continues to spread. No matter the persecution, no matter the affliction, no matter the challenge of the season, the gospel will endure. Oh, I may fail, 
This church may fail. Any of us could fail. But the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom that He died to establish, it will endure, it will persevere, and it will be here, and it will be alive and well on the day of His return. Of that, we can be sure. And so, we see... Tragically, an example of somebody interested in the gospel, amazed by the gospel, responsive to the gospel, respectful to the gospel. But in my view, they remain unconverted. Their interest was rooted in their own self-interest, power, position, popularity. That problem remains. And we remain committed to the mandate that's illustrated here, that the gospel is to bridge every gap. It is to bring reconciliation to all that are estranged. That it is that which we have been given, we've been entrusted with it, to take it uh, to the nations and to the neighbors. So that, again, that which Jesus died to accomplish and that which He is doing right now, namely, the building of His kingdom, will be accomplished. Pray with me this morning. Father, thank You for Your Word. It is a word that is true. It is a word that is powerful. It is a word that is eternal. It is a word that we will celebrate, that we will rejoice as we gather around you in eternity. I pray, God, uh, that we would hear your truth. We pray that your Spirit would apply these things to each of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.